Writing C is hard, but for years it was the only option for really boosting the speed of Python code bases. Let's face it, it's a daunting task. Writing C or C++ is like navigating a treacherous maze of buffer overflows and memory leaks. But what if I told you there's a new contender in town, ready to dethrone C and revolutionize Python extensions? Get ready to welcome the rise of Rust the new kid on the block, taking Python's performance to new heights. So say goodbye to the complexities of C and join me on a journey where speed meets simplicity in the realm of Python extensions. Rust is a language that's captured the minds and hearts of developers in just about every field, from low-level systems programming to web development to machine learning. It combines the performance of low-level languages like C or C++ with the safety and expressiveness of high-level languages. To accomplish this, Rust's compiler extensively checks memory usage in your code, using an ownership and borrowing model. This ensures that you can't have multiple mutable references or invalid references, preventing memory related bugs at compile time. Overall, you get memory safety, blazingly fast speed and fearless concurrency in a language with an elegant syntax and a rich type system. It's no real wonder that it consistently ranks as the most loved language in the Stack Overflow developer survey. If you're not convinced by mere hand waving and marketing spiel, let's talk numbers. In my previous video on Rust, I showed you how to write your first Python extension with Rust using the Maturin packaging tool and the PyO3 Rust bindings. We looked at a Fibonacci sequence generator written in Rust and saw that it was up to 90 times faster for larger Fibonacci numbers. That video will be linked in the description if you're interested. However, using micro benchmarks for oversimplified examples doesn't give you the full picture. So I'd like to take some time to look at some real world popular Python libraries that make heavy use of Rust under the hood. Before I do though, I couldn't resist writing more Rust. So I did another dumb benchmark. On your screen, you can see a nice naive Python function for finding the nth prime number. It iterates upwards from two, checking if each number is prime. If it is, it iterates the count of found primes and returns when it finds the nth number. The only optimization is that it only checks up to the square root of num rather than all the way up to num, as most examples do, making it an O square root of n algorithm. It's the same code again, but written in Rust. You can see that it's very readable and it's pretty much an exact copy of the Python code. And if you want to read it in more detail, please pause the video now. After doing some benchmarks for finding the 10th, 100th, 1000th, and 10,000th prime numbers, Rust was measurably faster in every case, and that includes the overhead introduced by the PyO3 bindings and the fact I was using my PC for other things at the time. And it wasn't actually that much harder to write. But let's look at some real world examples, starting with Pydantic. Pydantic is the most popular data validation library for Python. If you've not used it yourself, you've probably at least heard of it, as it also powers FastAPI, which has quickly become the most loved API library. Pydantic v2 is currently in development, and Samuel Colvin and the Pydantic team have been rewriting Pydantic's core validation logic in Rust. According to the Pydantic docs, the reasons for this are performance, code extensibility, and safety. The move has apparently improved Pydantic's validation times by 5 to 50x. The next example I'd like to share is Polars, my new favorite data frame library. A direct competitor with Pandas, Polars is a more declarative, in-memory data frame library with parallel processing and lazy query optimization. Oh, and of course, it's written in Rust. Like like Pydantic and my example, it uses Maturin and PyO3 under the hood. Rust made it really easy for Polars to add parallelization capabilities to their library, something which isn't possible in Pandas without extensions like Dask. This is a big limitation of writing C and C++ extensions in Python currently. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to take advantage of modern multi-core processors, which are everywhere these days. So, do we actually still need to write our Python extensions in C and C++? I'm gonna say no, but with a bit of an asterisk. Why while the Rust bindings for Python are maturing quickly, they're still relatively new, and there are a few advanced features that are still experimental that may be stable in C or C++ bindings. However, Rust is a lot easier to read and has modern high-level programming concepts that make it an absolute joy to write, especially if you're a functional programming enjoyer. If you've made it this far in the video, I have two things for you, gratitude and an invitation slash request for help. Firstly, thank you. It's because of people like you that it's possible for me to make videos like this. The YouTube algorithm is a tough mistress, but I'm having fun and you guys seem to be enjoying the content Content, which makes it even more fun for me. Secondly, I've been working on an AI powered side project over the past couple of months, and it's ready for some users to start beta testing it. It's an app called Wardrobe GPT, and the intention is to allow people to create new, trendy outfits from clothing items they already own, hopefully reducing the number of clothes they have to buy, and thus also reducing clothing waste from fast fashion. It should also save your wallet, too. If you're interested in trying it out, 
There'll be a Discord link in the video description to join a server where you can share your feedback. As a thank you, anyone who participates in the beta will get a free pro license for a year once the product launches, allowing you to upload unlimited clothing items to the platform. Finally, if you'd like to learn how to write your own Rust extension for Python, you can watch this video here.